Um, so can I just get a, a, an opening statement? We've obviously heard from you, Rich, in terms of what your SCARS does. Could I get an opening statement from each of the three other panelists um, in terms of um, what their role is and uh, what company they represent or organization they represent? Um, and in the context of David and Randall, you know, what their how their business intersects with online video in relation to games content. If we could start with David, that'd be great. Right. Um, I think it was interesting you asked earlier the question with everyone who's heard of eSports as such. Um, GFIN is an eSports company. We, we hold tournaments. Uh, we run tournaments every day. Every night we have people playing online for either a prize money or free in various competitions, ranging from games you probably would have heard of, like FIFA or Call of Duty, but also StarCraft uh, and a few other games as well. And then on weekends, uh, we have what we call the GFINITY Arena, which is three cinemas in Fulham Broadway, which we've taken over, and now we have them permanently. And we run live tournaments there every weekend, where we bring in teams uh, from around the world. Uh, last weekend, we had a StarCraft tournament where we had about seven players come in from Korea uh, to play which we then stream uh, live around the world. The interesting thing I find is that uh, even though we're based in the UK, generally when a lot of the competitions we do, most of the viewers are outside of the UK. In fact, the UK is probably about fifth on our list. Um, very heavy in Russia for certain games, uh, big in, obviously, Korea for other games, and the US too. So it varies upon which game is being played and which teams are playing. So that's why we're really keen to bring teams in from overseas. So we bring in teams from the US, Sweden as well. Um, I won't let's, let's, let's think about that with the intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Joe. Uh, I'm uh, Joe, and I am a last minute stand in. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, I represent, I'm CEO of UK Interactive Entertainment, who represents the games businesses in the UK, uh, right from the big publishers and developers uh, from EA to Activision, right down to the uh, uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of small micro studios that are popping up all over the country. Our mission is to make the UK the best place in the world to make and sell games. Um, I, we uh, help support, grow, and promote the sector, and more importantly, the whole culture around games, which sometimes does get uh, uh, sort of bypassed by traditional media. I came from a background of BBC and commissioning and multi-platform commissioning, as well as Channel 4 and education commissioning, where I commissioned games. Um, and uh, we used uh, YouTubers in the early days of YouTube um, if I was young enough again, I would be Twitch streaming every day, as I used to do on YouTube. Um, so it's our job to, we, we run uh, several special interest groups within the organization um, across the diversity of our membership. And one of them, which has become extremely popular, uh, is our eSports group, which has had over 40 uh, members, in which you're a chair. Cheer. Great. Randall? Brill. Um, so I'm Randall Bryan. I head up. Uh, a company called Endemol Beyond, which is a part of the Endemol Shine group. Um, so my remit really was to try and get my head around how we could build upon Endemol's previous history and legacy of creating great IP and building that across um, television. So my vision was to find ways to create that similar IP but in the digital space. So one of the channels that I'm here to discuss really is the Legends of Gaming, which the simple premise of it really was to put our arms around this gaming phenomena, try and bring all these superstar YouTubers onto one platform to create a really entertaining uh, gaming show, gaming tournament show. So I think actually we've got you know lots of views on the esports kind of sector. We're more just an entertainment platform that features some of the wonderful uh, characters that we have across the industry. Very good. I've got to introduce my colleague Steve at the end there, Steve Bailey, who's one one of my team members. Um, um, let's talk about um, content. Um, what, what, um, what have you found about how content uh, trends have changed in terms of uh, games content on online video? Obviously, it's evolved over time, Rich. Um, it's become, uh, I guess you have some sort of ideas um, before you make a, a producer piece, what's going to work and what isn't. and um, I guess you have certain stipulations over the length of content that you make for YouTube in particular. Um, I guess there's multiple dimensions to this, but can you talk a little bit about the content and how you go about deciding what will work and what won't work? And yeah, um, certainly in the beginning it was just making it up as you went along. It was um, playing games, 
and editing it into where the, where the funny bits were and trying not to make it too long. Um, during the, the years of Yogscast, we have we've refined that process. So we have people who look at um, who look at the analytics, and when we feed that back into the producers who do the planning of the of, of the program that we do, and so we try and get the sweet spots for the length of time and kind of content that we do. So you can get you can get certainly in YouTube uh, much more than than Twitch at the moment. You can get really good analytics showing um, where people have dropped off viewing, where, where the funny bits are, you see where people have, have rewound and watched them again, you see where, at what point people have shared your content. And so we dig very deeply into that and try and work out what works. But, and we have producers who set up the games at, at interesting points for, for the guys to play, but um, none of it's scripted and it is essentially, they go into their studios, they play games and they bounce off each other. And um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, if it doesn't, it gets left on the, on the um, cutting room floor. Um, but us usually it works. Um, the kinds of content we do um, hasn't... Uh, uh, we still do a lot of Let's Play, and um, that hasn't changed a huge amount. The Are there different kind of types of Let's Play? I mean, what is there... I mean, Let's Play is quite a broad kind of... It's people playing games and sort of talking over them and... Sort of it. reacting to what's going on in, in the action, but is there any sophistication to um, the Let's Play content? <laughs> I'd love to say yes. Um, not not to the actual content. No, no, it, it really is. It's about the sophistication. It's about understanding what will work and what won't work, okay. and uh, going through the planning process to to make it more likely that that will happen on each recording session. Um, because we, we create about ten hours of program every day across all the channels. We, we can't waste that time that we have the talent in the studio in. So we, we try and manage that process as much as possible. OK. Uh, Randall, um, you've got, I suppose, a specific format in terms of Legends of Gaming. Yep. You've, you've got this whole premise of bringing uh, YouTubers or YouTube, big YouTube personalities together to game against each other yep. um, or compete on certain... Um, types of challenges within games, etc. What What kind of drove you to decide on that format? Well, the format, just as a quick overview, is eight of the biggest gamers in the UK all coming together on one platform to go head to head. And it's a little bit, in my opinion, what the fans have been waiting for. You know, these YouTubers have built their careers over the last three, four years doing ad hoc kind of verses against their friends, challenging each other. And the numbers that these guys are hitting are insane. I think the Legends of Gaming channel kind of reaches 30 million subscribers collectively with 8 billion views. So there is a community. People know these gamers. People follow these gamers. And they've always wanted to see what it would be like having someone like Ali A play against Syndicate. And in their world, that is like having Liverpool play against Man United. It's a real, real big duel. People get together, get excited, and kind of want to watch those. So we wanted to bring everyone together to give the fans the opportunity to actually see that. Um, and I think it's also our ambition to elevate the content that was already being created on YouTube. So if we look at someone like a Rotashaw or a KSI, a lot of their FIFA vlogs will be done in their bedroom. They'll be, they're great entertainers, they're charismatic. They really, really do relate to their fans, but they're still simple productions done on a webcam. Sound quality is not so great. So what we wanted to do was actually bring that into a studio. We've got the neon lights. We've got the big intro. We've got kind of you know transitions, a bit of special effects, and we're just trying to make it a bit more of a spectacle um, and elevate the content a little bit. Okay. Um, Steve, have you got a question? Do you want to take a question? Uh, well, on the content side of things, to Rich, you said that your viewers consume about eight minutes per day, eight nine minutes roughly. Per session, yeah. Per session? Per session. Does that, is that um, just one video, or does that include multiple videos? Well, we, only, we only see our bits, so we, d we can't see the full session time that YouTube will know. Um, that can be more than one video, but... Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, gen generally, that is, a session is a video, usually of our content. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of video type, um, PewDiePie, for example, his montages are his biggest uh, viewership by far. Is there a type of video that you guys uh, could pull out of the bag whenever you needed to really hit. The, the, I mean, the, the, the biggest views come for uh, the music videos. Yeah. Um, so all our all our biggest um, all our sort of 20, 30 million view videos are are for very badly sung 
uh, parodies of of, uh, of other other songs. Um, usually animated, um, which is part of the fun. Well, what's the anim I mean, what's the animated? Can you explain? I haven't seen these examples. What's the uh, what's how is it animated? Is it animated of game scenes or in game or no, no, no. It's it's um, it's usually animated of. So all the guys have sort of alter ego characters. So it's okay. animated with them doing silly things that relate to the relate to the song. So this is completely original content. Original. Yeah, we used to do a lot of um, parodies of of hit songs, um, but there are some legal issues around that. So we we do <laughs> we do less of that these days, um, and a lot of our stuff is originally made. Uh, made stuff, yes, yep. and 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 we have an in-house animator who um, spends most of his time animating those songs. Um, David, is there anything on the content side? Obviously, yeah. you, you know it's tournament play and it's uh, esports, so it's kind of the format is set. But is there yeah. anything outside of the actual when the tournament's playing, or you know the casting, or anything like that, which well, I, is of I interest? Want, wanted to make clear a bit of differentiation between esports and YouTube. And when they talk about gamers on YouTube, they generally are not what I'd consider professional esports yeah, players. Generally, that, uh, we are rubbish at video games. <laughs> um, Probably rubbish, and that's, and that's what people like watching. Um, the people who are playing esports are full-time professional players. Um, they will train eight hours a day, six, seven days a week, and it's not just playing video games. They have dietitians. They have, um, uh, they, they they have fitness coaches they, they because they work on the fact of a healthy body, healthy mind. And you won't find any of them generally overweight um, because... And also the other thing is interesting with it is they generally burn out by about 26 years old um, because the focus and concentration is so intense when they're playing games. Um, and obviously, as you heard about the League of Legends, there's also quite big money in it too. Um, League of Legends had prize money of about $10.9 million. US dollars, which is uh, only after Wimbledon is the second highest sports prize money. It's more than if you win the FA Cup, you only get about two million. So, there's, and the, the winners of that were five million shares. So, it is a much more intense and much more, um, uh, as I say, the players, to some extent, they have big followings on Twitter. They do have certain areas there where, where people follow them on Facebook as well. But I just want to make sure there's a bit of a differentiation between it. Um, I wanted to steal a little bit of, um, you asked a question before, and yep. I want people in the audience just to think about something, think very carefully, because probably a lot of you won't remember it, is your parents, of how many of your parents actually played video games? And I think probably a lot of you go, no, my parents, you know, wouldn't even know what a video game was. In fact, I never even had one until I was sort of older or bought one for my kids. So then you think about yourselves, whether you've actually played a video game, and whether it be on your phone, whether it's Candy Crush or, or Solitaire, you've played a video game. So you, you think then the next generation, video games and playing the video games for entertainment and for sport is going to be second nature to them. It's not going to be something that's all foreign. And this is where esports is coming in. There's whole generations that have grown up watching people play really well. Watching, I used to love watching my kids play Mario Kart, and I'd try and play, but they'd always beat me. But it's always quite good fun watching. It's good fun watching people that are very good at it. And that's what happens with eSports with our, when we stream it, is those people uh, around the world that play those games love to watch other people playing very well. So I think, just to build off that quickly, um, when I started the Legends of Gaming channel uh, and above beyond, I didn't really understand eSports. I've got to be absolutely frank. You know, I kind of watched it as an observer from the outside. I knew that it was huge. But I just thought, how can gaming really be a sport? I've played FIFA my whole entire life, played it against friends, and it's always good banter, but I've never really seen it in the same category as a sport. We did the final of our tournament last year, and we had it in the studio, the YouTube space, the lights were down. We had our two finalists go head to head, and the tension in the air was you know, palpable. You could see the guys were shaking, beads of sweat, and my eyes were just absolutely focused on the gaming screen, and I thought, this isn't too dissimilar to actually going to a football match or being in a primetime boxing show. Like, you are really, really engaged with what's going on on screen. And I think that's just quite a unique transition that we're going to see over the next few years. It, it is actually as insane as a, as a sporting spectacle. Um, just another thing, I was going to make a comment on the, the title here of the future of digital media distribution. I think it really should be the future of media distribution. And that's what's made the change of why esports has been able to come up is because if we didn't have the internet and we didn't have broadband, we probably wouldn't be having some of these conversations as such. So it's, and what it, what it is, I think, and 
I think the comment was made earlier by Richard Ayres about the composition of this audience of there's not many people from the sports business, a lot of games companies here, a lot of other people, is that traditional media and some of the sports teams just don't get it or haven't get it, got it or are trying to catch up. Um, interesting talking about a company that does our distribution called Twitch, which a lot of people heard, you know, they bought out by Amazon. Uh, on the table at the time, they thought it was going to be Google, and it was eight or 900 million Twitch was bought. The big people that l lost out on that deal were people like Comcast or Liberty Media or Fox, in not picking up on a new distribution channel for them to put their media out. And I think an interesting thing you look at sport too is the fact that when the media starts going digital, how do the sports brands and IP control and manage their IP as such? Because it's going to be much more ubiquitous that people can watch it. Um, I could go on a bit, but there was, yeah. there was one comment I wanted to make <laughs> about sport where one, uh, when I say sporting franchise has probably got it, and that's in America with Major League Baseball. They actually set up their own streaming service in 2000, year 2000. Now it makes up to 8% of their income, 800 million a year they make from streaming their games uh, live to their fans. Um, Joe, Sorry. I want to ask you a question about independent developers and how uh, YouTube channels have really taken to independent content and um, enabled some games to actually become viral hits or you know, develop into much bigger properties off the back of that. Um, in your experience, what, what are the independent developers saying about the power of kind of online video platforms, um, uh, social online video platforms like YouTube in the context of their business opportunities? Are they seeking out sort of partnerships with um, independent channels and how, how no, I, think, I think it? it's, it's just, a, you know, it, there is nothing unusual about the internet. There's nothing unusual about what's happening, in, whether it be eSports, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be Let's Play videos. This is just human behavior, right? It's just a different way to get to view it or to distribute it. Um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the fact that there's nothing, no difference between eSports and traditional sports. There isn't. We're all humans. We like to watch people who are better than us. In fact, eSports existed in 1970s with uh, uh, Space Invaders tournaments. Um, so, you know, indeed developers, so independent developers, there's been a big swell of independent developers because of these things and because of the ability to uh, have free tools that make it more accessible to make games um, like Unity and Epic, the engines. And, you know, we have this uh, fantastic opportunity and innovation in different business models and you can go straight to your players globally, you can immediately become an exporter. So it makes sense that uh, you know, they, it's quite a crowded marketplace that they need to use every channel available to them uh, to get some kind of recognition and to uh, stick out from a crowded marketplace. You look at the App Store, for instance, a lot of the indies are focused either on PC games because of the Steam platform, uh, or uh, which allows you to have different business models. So you can start charging people for a really, really early version of a game in alpha you know, before it's completely unfinished, which is just insane, <laughs> but amazing. Um, and these things have, you know, the App Store in particular coincided with this explosion of these micro studios, independent developers, but it's become crowded and the top category in, across all platforms is always games. So they have to form these relationships and sometimes it's serendipitous, you know, uh, Thomas Was Alone, which was created by fantastic indie hero of the UK at the moment called Mike Bithell, called Mike Bithell. Um, really, it kind of took off once um, uh, a, a very popular YouTuber uh, did a review of it. And, you know, they, they understand that this is exactly the same as, as how any other media has ever worked. It's about relationships and it is about personality, as we've heard. The games industry and games culture generally has been completely ignored by mainstream media uh, in terms of reflecting it back to its audiences. and. The reason why these communities of uh, YouTubers, Let's Play videos, Twitch, esports fans exist is because finally they're able to share in that stuff that they love um, because TV simply isn't reflecting in any way games culture and the culture which they love back at them in any way. <laughs> and I can say that with confidence. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you live and die by uh, being able to get that discoverability. A lot of it is, is serendipitous. 
a lot of it one is of, strategic. One of the big issues of the platform is the discoverability. Obviously, um, not so much on live events with esports, where it's kind of framed in a in a specific session which you go and watch. Um, but in terms of YouTube, but, yeah. you know, actually finding content and. Well, now but, we've got yeah. a huge amount of more content coming onto the So platform. finding content is always a problem, right? Mm. So you need people to be saying to you, uh, oh, I like this, or uh, there's this Let's Play video that's uh, showing you this thing, and, and PewDiePie is leading the pack uh, in a lot of ways for a younger demographic as well, um, you know, in doing that. But um, I think that, it, again, it's about, it's about, for me, it's about them revealing their personality behind the game. And I think the clever indie developers are the ones who are using Twitch and using YouTube in a way to peel open and unveil, you know, sort of un peel open the layers of development. And they're very much, you know, we live and die by our community, by our fans, by the people who are uh, getting interested at an early stage in the concept and the idea, and you're building up that interest and awareness. People are doing that in the games industry very successfully through crowd uh, funding campaigns. Um, regardless of whether they get the target money or not, it's about that getting that audience, getting that community of interest in and building on that. Um, another great example is uh, uh, a guy called, indie developer called Rami Ishmael um, uh, from Holland who uh, calls it performative development, which I love. So basically he uses Twitch and live streams his development process. So he's talking to his audience and they're asking questions as he's developing the game. You know, who would have thunk it? Uh, if I'd been pitched that idea at Channel 4 or BBC, uh, I would never have got it greenlit. <laughs> uh, Randall, do you have any comments on discoverability? Because I, I mean, what? Yeah. yeah. So, how, um, how do you think um, something like YouTube, some a platform like YouTube, could improve to? Well, there's there's two things. Help I mean, with discoverability. Yesterday we googled gaming. On we do all the word gaming, uh, came up with 250 million results. You go on YouTube, you do the same, you're hitting around 200 million results for gaming as a title. That means there's 250 million pieces of content out there that are gaming. Like, how on earth am I ever going to know which one of those is going to be a good video? So I think the YouTube platform is incredibly good at actually hiding content. Um, <laughs> It's built on an algorithm which you know, just looks at accelerated views, engagements, and likes, which is fine. But if you're an incumbent with a big subscriber base, you're always going to be surfaced to the top of that algorithm. So what we're trying to do is find a way to bring back the role of an editor in a sense of, actually, there are certain pieces of content which have higher levels of production, which might be a bit more premium, which you might be able to sell a bit more advertising against. And we need to find a way to get that actually surfaced to the top. Um, so our thoughts are really starting to build off YouTube as a platform and looking at networks like AOL, like Twitch, um, that actually have more editorialized platforms where they can give you prominence on the home page, they can give you prominence in display media, and actually go to platforms that do have that, that ability to, to push content rather than just to um, hide you in a, in a stack of other videos. But can I just make a point on that? So what, what I find interesting is um, at, Ch at BBC, we had long discussions, t strategic discussions about you know, channels and the death of channels because of iPlayer, which was a load of nonsense, because channels are a key way in which people can navigate and to uh, learn what to expect. And it's the same with music labels, and it's the same with you know, HBO. I know that I'm going to like an HBO. And I think there's quite a lot that actually games platforms can uh, still be taking on from that sort of strategy to aid discoverability because whether we like it or not, you know, the curation or the editorialization is actually who can pay the most money to get that to the to the top page. You know, whereas a, a, a different approach is needed. Um, we're going to go to the floor for questions in a minute. I, while people are thinking about questions, um, what about how do you see the landscape developing? Um, obviously, we've got these dominant platforms, YouTube, uh, Twitch in the streaming space, on not all, not all the time, but um, most of the time, you know, Twitch on a day to day basis is the biggest platform for streaming. Uh, YouTube dominates the pre recorded space. Um, we've talked a little bit about Facebook and how that could potentially impact um, the YouTube model. Um, do you see that as a, as a major disruptor, Rich? Um, how, how, do you, how do you see the uh, platform landscapes sort of emerging? Well, I, I think we'll definitely see quite a lot of fragmentation. I think Facebook's interesting, but we also know that um, Facebook, Facebook um, doesn't play that well to the younger audience, and this is about 
a younger audience. I think it might be, I, I think we don't know what the big disruptor is. I mean, it might be Snapchat, um, but it's probably something that's being launched right now, um, which in six months will be the place where kids want to watch their video. Uh, YouTube's sort of too big and baggy and has stopped working that well as far as being able to serendipitously find great content. Mm. Um, YouTube have to create a business model that works for them where they make money from something that they've invested a lot of money in. Um, and so YouTube is going to be more and more about the top 1% and the top 5% and it's going to become much harder to break through. The age of these big breakout YouTubers um, is... Do you think that phase is it's done? It's pretty much done, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's done. It's virtual reality is the interesting thing to look at. If you look at what was behind, uh, or who was behind the Facebook acquisition of Oculus Rift, which was the first kind of virtual reality headset to hit the consciousness uh, in recent years, and it was crowdfunded, it was kickstarted. Um, it was actually driven by, that acquisition deal was driven by the creator of Second Life, and I know Second Life got a really bad rap. I loved Second Life. I loved hanging out in Second Life with my friends because I felt that co-presence and I went to watch films in Second Life, I went to lectures, I went to play games in Second Life. It was just bizarre. And he was actually, Corey Andreka drove that acquisition deal. So I'm interested to, to see what they do, you know, and I can see, you know, that, that, tele, that, that co-presence, um, particularly around esports, you know, I, I, I think virtual reality, despite people who say naysayers, for me, as a crap gamer who hates controls, controllers, um, I think virtual reality is going to be a massive disruption. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Any other thoughts? I, I was just going to say, I think um, when you talked about, I think the big opportunity is the distribution where as other IP owners and uh, media companies start picking up a lot more on streaming and uh, uh, as such, it means there's opportunity then for other streaming companies rather than, say, for an example, just Twitch almost having, in our area, the market to themselves. There are other small ones there, but I think uh, it'll be, you'll find that will be obviously, um, I think, uh, channels just like Sky on, uh, on streaming uh, as such, where you'll have your, your games channel, your eSports channel, um, and people will be able to I mean, access it everywhere. So I think there's opportunity there um, because I don't think um, one company will be able to handle it all. OK. Question from Jack. Uh, we saw from Pierce's slides earlier that a lot of the content is uh, from indie, develop indie developers and third parties. Um, are, the big, are the big publishers getting it wrong, or what can they do better? Um, from our, from our, our point of view, um, the sort of entertainment side, um, yes, they have got it wrong for, for a long time. And um, they're starting the last year or so. They've very much understood what's happening, and they've started to engage. And they're building into their games um, much more Let's Play style stuff. I mean, if you, um, I mean, GTA is a good example where you know they've built in-game video editing software. So yeah. the latest release, you can create loads of cinema. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, the G GTA thing is going to be enormous. Um, I think you know it has Let's Play videos have been dominated by Minecraft for a long time, and that was just pure pure luck. Um, but yeah, we're, they're, they're definitely engaging in it. They definitely see the value of it. They're just um, pretty late to the party. I think that YouTube, sorry, I'll talk about YouTube specifically because that's the kind of area that I work in, but it's the platform of the niche. So there's never a chance that I am bread, which is a game where you are just a slice of bread and you've got to flop around on a table and put jab on yourself. <laughs> there's, there's no platform in the world that that could ever get any airtime. So what's happening on YouTube is it's democratization. It's like people actually think, you know what? That's hilarious, how ridiculous that, I'll never see it anywhere else. And all of a sudden, they turn into these real viral surges. So I think indie game developers have got an opportunity to do things that you can innovate within those digital video platforms that you just can't do anywhere else and get the same attention, the same noise. So there's two different spectrums. There are the indie games that, that will get incredible breakthrough because they're so irreverent. And then there are what are essentially cinematic movie releases like the Call of Duties. So you have both. And it's just interesting and it's quite exciting that the platform can accommodate for both of those. So our channel does. We try and harness both of those kind of formats. And <coughs> I'm sure across the board they also um, like to feature a mix of that content. Anyone 
also have, I mean, they're better set up. You know, we, don't, we shouldn't underestimate. We talk in terms of big companies and small companies rather than developers and indies and publishers. And they're better set up, you know, to be resourcing, have a team of community managers, um, to be understanding that that's a co-creation process. Um, but they, they also, we shouldn't underestimate still the power of traditional advertising on TV. You know, when Washing Monsters advertised around adult telly, not sex telly, I mean adult program, I mean, you know, grown-up telly. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you know, signified a real shoot in trust and people started buying, you know, uh, Washing Monsters. And when uh, Candy Crush King was able, because uh, TV, TV advertising is expensive, to put the, that game right in front of a non-traditional, non-core audience, non-core gamer audience, whatever the hell that means, you know, Candy Crush suddenly became a game that loads of women played. But women don't just play Candy Crush. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just w one final question, and it's really about the challenges, and I think zero in on the challenges of monetization of content. Obviously, most of your revenue comes from um, ads. Is ad, um, sorry, most of your revenue is from ads. Yes. Um, is that sustainable as a commercial model from your perspective? I know you've tried to diversify into other segments. Um, I think that's a question that's relevant to all the three uh, operators within the, within the space. How, how is ad revenue and is that going to maintain itself? Is it going to grow? Is it, what, what's the, what are the kind of dynamics of that? Um, well, pre-roll pre ad revenue, so um, CPM-based pre-roll is, um, which is the still our main revenue stream, it is um, CPMs are going down. There is more video, there is not that much more money. Um, so it's getting evened out under, uh, so CPMs have come down. So we made less money through that route. So the, to have a sustainable business, a business where we employ 20, 30 people to be behind the scenes, where we have studios, where we try and build new stars, um, we need to have other revenue streams. We can't sustain ourselves just from advertising. So. Um, Things like um, Patreon is very interesting. Things like subscription models are really interesting. Um, but for us, we have a big community, and it's it's about um, someone said earlier about turning fans into customers. Um, that is a that is a model for us, but doing it in a way that um, works for everyone. And um, David, I mean, I, I don't think ad, yeah. we, we were forecasting that the ad revenue for esports is going to grow quite substantially over the next few years. Is that? Yeah, unfortunately, at the moment, I don't think there's too many esports companies making too much money uh, at all. Um, but it is sort of very much at that uh, growth stage. And the main sort of revenue streams at the moment are through sponsorship and advertising. And uh, it would be quite surprising, I think, some of the uh, people that are sponsoring, people like American Express, Nissan, uh, obviously Red Bull and, and Coca Cola actually have an esports department as well. Because they actually get it, because uh, we very much know our audience and have great access to them and their consumption of media is higher than the mainstream media. So an eSports fan will watch an average of 27 minutes of eSports compared to, say, normal sports in a month, you know, it's 13 minutes. I think there's reasons for that because, you know, a lot of normal sports fans will actually probably be at a live game and just watch the highlights or something later. But they actually get really into it. So I think our opportunities are there. Um, the other one that um, we really don't work on too much is uh, subscription uh, uh, but the, that will come. I think the subscription area is, is very interesting. If you look in 2014, esports audience, if you look across what the behavior, again, at a human level, what is it that they like? So it's not just about ad revenue, it's about different types of deals that can be done. So esports audiences are more likely to have a paid subscription to Spotify, Netflix, and HBO. 46% uh, of the esports um, uh, uh, audience had a paid subscription to Spotify. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that kind of behavior and you look at that kind of, okay, so how do we, how do, we do a, a, a cross deal, a cross platform deal that actually capitalize on that kind of behavior? Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, again, the, the personalities and the sponsorship. So I remember I used to be a tech, tech journalist and did a piece on Jonathan Fatality Wendell in 2003. <laughs> and at the time he was the highest earning esports star. And he had, you know, a mouse, sponsored mouse named after him, a motherboard named after him, a machine, everything. So everything he touched, you know, literally turned to gold. I think just quickly, three things. Um, firstly, mobile. So we see over 60% of all of our views coming off mobile. It's incredibly hard to monetize on mobile at the moment. So that's going to be a real challenge for us moving forward. Not for a free-to-play game. 
free to play game, <laughs> absolutely. If you're an app and you can you can get those on um, platforms, you, you'll have success. But it's hard to monetize video content on mobile. I think the other one is that we see YouTube again as a mar as a marketing platform, rather than a commercial platform where you're going to build a sustainable business on CPM rates. We're not quite at the same stage as Yogcast. We've got a limited number of channels. So we really need to rely on the third point, which I believe is quality. So actually, there's a bit of um, education to do within the marketplace about the value of digital content. I think still people still see your slide, cats on skateboards, as being the predominant kind of generalization of, of digital video. So what we want to try and do is make sure that the content we're creating is familiar with the advertisers that spend huge amounts of money on marketing and promotions. So when I can walk into a brand or an advertiser, I can actually say, you know what, this is similar to the sorts of quality you're normally happy to associate your brand against. Um, and that can be huge. And I think the last thing is live events. Um, so you can drive huge numbers of people from these YouTube channels to actually turn up and see their stars in the flesh. Um, we're looking at doing a Legends of Gaming live event in September, which is essentially going to bring all the gamers back down to play on a platform. And we hope that's going to be over three days with you know, 40,000 people turning up. If, if they all do, that'd be great. Um, so I think that live is, real, is a real area that's going to that's continue to blow up over the next few years. Thank you very much indeed for the whole of the panel. Thank you.